Welcome to the obituary episode of the Views from 314 Feet podcast as we apparently throw dirt on the Yankee season after losing the series to the Boston Red Sox and Fenway. My name is Randy Wilkins. I have a new nickname that I didn't know I had, but we will get to that uh, a little bit later in the podcast. And as always, I'm joined by Yankees beat reporter from the Athletic, Chris Kirshner. Chris, how are you? I'm doing better than the Yankees, who you know, <laughs> whose season ended last night. It's unfortunate. The season's over. Everything's canceled. Uh, I actually got word that they're you know just forfeiting the rest of the games. As they should. As they should. What are you going to write about now from uh, June 17th until uh, the offseason starts? Yeah, I mean, we got the draft coming up. <laughs> uh can look ahead to free agency you know there's so there's so many angles to write about you know soto's free agency and you know how it uh how the payroll can can shape around that so i'll I'll have some stuff to to come out with that's good there's plenty there are plenty of subjects to discuss when it comes to the new york yankees none of them include the actual like play on the field but um well no because are, the season's over right the season ended that's why we're wrapping it up this is uh the obituary episode of uh, views. So, um, yeah, we'll just go through all the things that went wrong this season and then uh, <laughs> come up with an all-season plan on June 17th um, for the Yankees to be a better team next year so they're not like 2022 and 2023 and 2024. So um, we're going to get to work on that pretty soon. So, um, obviously, we're making some fun and uh, – making some light of things after the uh, Yankees performance in Boston. Um, I do want to remind people that although they lost the last two games, they do come home with a winning road trip. They won four games uh, in Kansas city and Boston. So they come back with a winning record. I know that like some people don't want to hear that because you know, whatever happens last is the most important thing in the world. And I get that. That's fine. Totally. That's how the world works. Um, but the Yankees were a few ground balls away from sweeping Kansas City and just played two bad games um, over the over the weekend in Boston. So um, just a reminder before we get into this, the Yankees come home with a winning record on their latest road trip. They won more games than they lost. And they are still 26 games over 500. So, Chris, um, your thoughts, your initial thoughts about the uh, Yankees Red Sox series this weekend? I mean, I think they uh, played terribly the past two days. Like, there's no yeah, sugarcoating sure. that. Like, yeah, they were bad. They were yeah, bad. like, there, there's no sugarcoating that. Um, yesterday was certainly their most embarrassing performance uh you know boston steals nine bases i mean anytime you give up that amount of stolen bases like something went terribly wrong right um they didn't come up with timely hits in the past couple of days um all series really the starting pitching wasn't great like even though they won on friday heel wasn't very crisp um didn't didn't have his command. Um, maybe he was too amped up. I don't know, but he didn't look like his usual self on he Friday. Said he, he said he was amped up. He said that he got kind of caught up in the Yankees. That's Red right. Sox robbery. So yeah. Um, Saturday, Carlos wasn't sharp at all. Um, and then in Sunday's game, Stroman didn't have command either. Um, it's hard to win. A series when you're starting pitching, you know, just doesn't perform very well. So that that's one thing. And then um, in Sunday's game, they were down four three in the seventh with uh, bases loaded, three out count, and they don't score, which is really bad. Like you have to, you have to at least tie the game in that yeah. situation. Yeah, that you was know, terrible. Clay, Oh, that was really, really bad. You know, Glaber expands the zone on 3-2. Um, Trevino strikes out. And then DJ probably had his best hit of the season with, with that line drive to center field to end the inning. 
Um, but you you have to score there. there there's really no excuse. Um, you know, and if they come through in that situation, you know, who knows? They may they may win that game. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it it wasn't it wasn't the crisp baseball that they have shown for most of the season. Again, I I, uh, I was on um, with Bruce Beck last night on NBC, and and the the how I described it was that it's three games of one sixty two. Like it's not like in the grand scheme, it's not that big of a deal. Number one, because uh, the Red Sox are not who you're fighting with in the division. Like the division right. is just a two team race at this point. Right. No one else is winning it other than the Yankees or the Orioles. Um, the you're not you're also even if the Yankees don't win the division, they're not fighting with the Red Sox for a wild card um, spot. So like you're not really fighting with them for anything. Like I obviously get the rivalry. Obviously you want to beat the Red Sox. I get it, but it's, it's really not that big of a deal. Like these games against the Orioles are obviously big games because th- this is the team right. that you're fighting with in the, in the division. Like one of these teams, they're probably both going to win a hundred plus games and right. their season's going to come down to a three game wild card. Like right. you, you certainly want to avoid that if you're the Yankees or the Orioles for that regard, like you don't want to be in there, uh, especially if you win a hundred plus games and, you know, like we just saw this past weekend, you know, two bad games and your season is done. So like these games are certainly important. Um, But, you know, it wasn't Chris baseball this weekend. I don't think it's an indictment on the season. I don't think they're frauds. I don't think the season is over. They obviously have some, some stuff to clean up and that's basically what we've been discussing since April. I'm pretty sure we discussed in April how the Yankees catchers couldn't throw anyone out. And and I was surprised that they haven't been exposed up until yesterday. Like we were discussing that in April yes. about how they weren't able to throw anyone out. And yesterday was really the first time that a team tried them. I I expect the Orioles to do the same because they have speed. Um, the Braves have speed too. So it, it could be a, it could be an ugly week in that regard for the Yankees because they're playing three against the Orioles. And then this weekend the Braves come in and they also have speed. So, you know, it, it could be ugly on the base paths for the Yankees, but also I, I should say um, in yesterday's game, some of that is also on Stroman, like the amount of yeah. walks, you know, he's giving up hard hits. Like you also have to pitch better to not let them get on base. Right. And, exactly. And, and also, he's one of the easier pitchers to steal off of. But, you know, I, I did watch all nine um, stolen bases from the high home plate angle that we have access to as, as reporters. In my unofficial count, six of those were on Trevino other, with either his poor arm or he couldn't get a grip on the baseball. You know, that that is on him to not get a, a, a good grip on the ball. The one in the second inning when, where Dom Smith stole second, led to two runs on the two-run single. Um, you know, if he gets a good grip on the ball, even with his poor arm, he probably gets him out. They, they were supposed to throw through on that play. He just didn't have a good grip on it. But, you know, it wasn't like, you know, from my in, – in my opinion, they weren't getting crazy jumps on him. Um you know, he just has a weak arm and a couple of those balls he, he obviously bobbled and didn't have a good grip on. Um, it's something that obviously has to improve moving forward. Yeah, I mean, he, it's the arm, but also it's the pop time. I mean, he's pretty slow pop time wise, too. So it's like the combination of both. But, yeah, we've we've talked about this since the beginning of the season. Like we, we noticed that right away. Um, and I said this on Twitter last night. I think part of the reason beyond the the um explanation you just gave for why all those stolen bases took place boston's offense needs to do that i mean this isn't the typical boston red sox offense that we're used to where they just have a bunch of sluggers and on base guys that are just you know hitting the ball all over the park they don't have those guys so they've turned into a very 
for lack of a better term, scrappy, contact-oriented team that has to be aggressive on a base pass. I mean, it wasn't just the stolen bases. Uh, Duran stared Aaron Judge down going from first to second and was like, I'm just going to take third on you because you're not attacking the baseball. That's how Boston's going to play. They're not a good offense. They don't have good hitters in their team from top to bottom. They're going to have to do things like that to score and generate runs. They have like Tyler O'Neill and Devers to drive the ball and maybe one other person if Casas is in there. So that's kind of their new identity because that's the only way that they can survive offensively. I just felt like Boston was super aggressive with the Yankees in general and it caught the Yankees off guard. I mean, to me, that play with Duran and Judge was a perfect microcosm of how that series ended up going. Judge Judge, Judge was not hustling to that ball. He didn't attack that ball. He just made an assumption that I have a great arm. Duran's not at second yet. I'm just going to, like, throw this ball in. And Duran was like, nah, man, I'm going to third. Like, you're not going to throw me out. I already know you're not going to throw me out because you're not attacking the ball. So – I think one team was way more aggressive than the other and that the aggressive team won. But I think that there's perspective that's needed for that, especially when we talk about other teams. Boston has to do that or they're not going to score runs. I mean, that that lineup is not good. So they don't really have a choice. I think when we look at teams like Baltimore, way different lineup, obviously. So I think that they'll pick their spots. They know that that's probably something that they can potentially take advantage of but i don't i don't think they're gonna get nine stolen bases in a game because they're gonna be driving the ball they're they're looking to slug they're looking to do what the yankees do i mean it up and down the lineup i mean their leadoff guy i mean yeah how how many home runs does he have now 22 22. 23 yeah i mean he's he's a leadoff guy fast as hell my man's trying to hit it out of the park so I, I do think that that's something that they'll have and they'll probably test the Yankees. Um, but I'm I'm still more concerned about, you know, getting keeping these guys in the ballpark and, you know, pitching effectively in the zone and, and things like that. So I know people reacted to the game last night and rightfully so. That was terrible. Um, nine stolen bases is unacceptable. And the Yankees will tell you that Trevino will tell you that. But I don't know. I know people were saying that they exposed them. The the Red Sox exposed the Yankees. And it's like, man, this has been there all year. This isn't anything new. And you're also facing a team that, again, they don't have many offensive options to, like, be a threat. So I, I look at this more as them, the Red Sox, needing to do all these, like, baseball things to score runs versus someone got exposed because that's been there. Like, Wells can't throw either. That's not going to change. Like. It's going to be a problem all year, but like you said, we've talked about it since April. But I want to go back to the seventh inning and the Glaber at bat. Um, that now everybody knows I've defended Glaber. Um, I had my issues with Glaber when he played short, but when he went back to second, I thought, he, and I still believe this, he's been one of their best hitters over the last couple of years. Um. Even then, that was a horrific at bat. And I will venture to say, given the context, where we are in the season, all the um, factors that go into that one at bat, I would put that as the worst at bat of the season so far. I mean, that that was unacceptable. But I want to like dig into the at bat a little bit because I think it's a microcosm of Glaber's season and part of the issues that he's having right now. and. I did a little bit of quick research um, on baseball savant, and uh, I'm going to talk while I, I look it up again. Um, I, I think the 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 things that bother me about Glaber's at bat was his lack of aggression on 3-0 and 3-1. Like you got to 3-0 and got two hittable pitches to not only like make contact, but to drive the ball like. Not to say or guarantee that he would have gotten an extra base hit, a home run, none of those things. But you have to attack those pitches. It's 3-0, no outs, bases loaded. That is like the ultimate position for any hitter to be in. That is that is like nirvana. And he just did not take advantage of the situation. And that was what was disappointing to me. 
when you get to three two and a guy throws you a sweeper in the dirt, that's just a nasty pitch. And that like took a whole bunch of guts. Three two, no outs, bases loaded in a one run game to throw that pitch. He's going to strike Judge out on that pitch. He's going to strike Soto out on that pitch because it's just a gutsy call. The problem to me is 3 0 3 1, not attacking these pitches that are like basically down the middle. And I was looking at Glaber's numbers because it it feels like he's done that a lot. And um, I was looking at uh, some of his plate discipline numbers and his zone contact has dropped six percentage points from last year. That's not good. Like he's just he's either like missing them or he's not swinging at them. Um, His chase rate has gone down. Uh, from last year, but his chase contact is also 5% down. So it's like just the, the sheer like volume of contact that he's making has decreased. And it's on top of all the other things that are going on with him. He's like not aggressive anymore or not as aggressive as he was. And when he is aggressive, he's not making as much contact. And that at bat was like, the perfect illustration of what's going on with him, in my opinion. Like, you you have to attack those pitches. They're right there. Like, and again, you're not guaranteeing that he's going to drive the ball or have some big hit, but you have to, like, go after them. Like, that guy's in the worst position a pitcher could possibly be in, and he just let the guy off the hook. So that at, that at bat and that aspect of that at bat bothered me the most. Once he got the 3-2 and I got through that pitch, he was going to strike out. I feel like any batter was going to strike out there. It was just a great pitch. But you got to – I mean, you got to attack. Yeah. That, that I mean, seemed I, like a theme all – sorry. That seemed like a theme the last two games. That one team was super aggressive, mm-hmm. and the Yankees weren't and just kind of like were just playing baseball, and the other ones playing with their hair on fire. 100%. And you get in the hitter's counts to hit – like you get three zero counts to hit, three one counts to hit, especially in those situations. Like you, you know, you likely know the pitcher is going to be across the plate on three zero three one. You also have to just put the ball in play. I'm not, I'm not necessarily in favor of just putting the ball in play just, just for the hell of it. But in this situation, like putting in the ball, putting the ball in play may get you at least one run, and then the the game is tied. Um, cause when you get, when you strike out and don't do anything, then it's one out. And then you have a very slow hitter at the plate in Trevino who, you know, he hits a ground ball and the inning's over. Um, so when you have zero outs, like you have to, in bases loaded, like you have to put the ball in play there just to get at least one run. And then you have a new game. Um, I tur- I, I totally agree with you that it's, the worst at bat of the season, given the, given the situation, given, you know, how poorly the weekend was going. Cause you, you, you put the ball in play there and who knows what happens. You, you right. may win two of three games and you know, nobody's freaking out. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a bad at bat. Um, you know, we've obviously discussed Glaber a lot. Um, you know, he's been performing better as of late, Obviously, obviously, this past weekend was not his finest um, collection of games. But, you know, if you look at from what he's done since like May 1st, he, you know, he he has over a 100 WRC plus the numbers on a whole on the season, obviously, are not good. The amount of errors, not good. Um, But he has at least been showing signs of being the Glaber that we know offensively, unlike some other, you know, hitters on the team, namely Anthony Rizzo, who just haven't shown anything really this season. You know, there are at least signs that Glaber has been turning the corner as of late. Yeah. And I know that there are a lot of people and it happened again last night on Twitter, which I get there's frustration. Like I'm not Glaber is not having a good season. And again, I I thought he had the worst at bat of the season last night. But there are a lot of calls to trade Glaber, and I don't think he's going anywhere. And I think part of the reason is 
exactly what you just said. He's he's showing some signs that he can get back to what he was in the past. And I think the Yankees are just going to roll with it. I also don't know what his trade value is. You know, you can't just say we want to trade him or we want him out of here and not acknowledge that other teams are looking at how he's playing too. And they know his contract status and they know that in some ways he's a, I guess, emotional player. I don't want to say that in a derogatory sense. Like I'm not trying to criticize him, but you know, his, his feelings get involved sometimes and sometimes it impacts his play. I don't know what you get for Glaber if you tried to trade him and then you have to, re- now you have to replace potentially three spots on the infield. So I don't think that's realistic. I no. understand. I understand the sentiment. I'm not like pretending that, you know, it's a ridiculous statement. It's just not realistic and doesn't really factor into what the Yankees need. They're not going to create another hole for themselves, especially because Glaber has picked it up a little bit. He needs to pick it up a lot more. I like even with the improvement is not good enough. He needs to be better than what he has been up until this point. But I don't he's not do you think he's getting traded? I don't think he's going anywhere. No. I mean for the reasons you just said, you know, he is a free agent at the end of the year. He's making a lot of money. Obviously that will be prorated some if, you know, they did trade him. I don't really know why they would trade him, honestly. Like they wouldn't be getting a good prospect or prospects in return for him just because, you know, that's just how baseball works. So, you know, a, a, a free agent to be who is underperforming in his free agent year, it's probably not getting you much in return. So for the Yankees, like he'd probably just be banking on him turning it around at some point. I think that's probably more valuable, honestly, than trading him for basically nothing. Like you're not going to like, I think sometimes fans think like, oh, he's a household name. He's going to, you know, get a team's, you know, top five prospect. Like it it doesn't really work that way when the guy's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. And he's also underperforming and there are concerns both offensively and defensively. So it's not like one, one side of the ball where teams can, you know, like really, really good, production for the second half of the season. So they're they're not they're not going to get anything of value to make it worthwhile to move on from him. So you just have to you know hope it turns around. Obviously it's not ideal, especially for a team that wants to win a World Series. You know, you you'd hope to go into October with confidence in everybody. Um you know, he's certainly one guy right now, you know, if if the playoffs started tomorrow where you don't have confidence in, you don't have confidence in first base, you don't have confidence at, at third base. Um, there's obviously question marks in the bullpen. So, yeah, he would be one of those guys where if, if October was tomorrow, that you don't have much confidence in. Right, and there's nobody to replace him. I yeah, mean, and like you're not bringing up Peraza. John Birdie's hurt. Yeah, I mean, he, he, you know, he could play second, but he's hurt. So, yeah, people are suggesting the same people that they don't want playing on the corners. So, like, how does that work? You're like, you're not, you're not going to put Oswaldo at second if you don't like him at third. I mean, it's the same issue. So, he's just playing a different position. You're not going to put, you're certainly not going to put LeMayhew there. You can't even play the position. So, I mean, it, you just got to roll with it at this point and hope that, like, he figures it out at some point. And again, it's June 17th. There's still, you know, it's not early in the season, obviously, but there's still like a lot of season left. We're a little bit past the the third way point or whatever the proper phrasing would be in the season. So, I mean, you could turn it around. I, I Even for as like difficult as season is for Glaber, there are bigger issues player position wise than Glaber. And now with Rizzo being potentially heading to the IL, you know, now there's a conversation to be had about how are the Yankees going to immediately dress the corner infield? I think it's time for Ben Rice to get a call up if Rizzo 
goes to the IL. I don't think there's any strong argument against that at this point. He's tearing up the minors. You have to call somebody up. Corner infield has been an issue. This is, I don't want to say it's a free audition because it comes at the expense of someone's health, but it's essentially a showcase to, to let you know if Ben Rice can handle the majors as you get closer to the trade deadline. I mean, to me, that feels like a no-brainer, and he should be, if he does get called up, he should get the majority of the at-bats. Like, I don't think this this should be DJ at first, Oswaldo at third, Rice on the bench. Like, we don't – he's been tearing it up. See what you have. If you have some magic in the bottle, use it. Maybe he can be a legitimate MLB player at some point. Maybe he can be that right away. But if Rizzo goes to the IL, to me, Ben Rice should get the call up and he should get the at bats. Like I don't, I don't know why they would go in a different direction. Hopefully, they don't. In my opinion, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. You know, it doesn't make much sense, in my opinion, to have you know Oswald Peraza come up to play third, and then you slide, you know, Lemayu to first, or like you said, have Cabrera come in and call up Peraza as a bench option. Um, if Rizzo is seriously hurt, which we still don't know um, as of recording this, um, it totally makes sense to have Ben Rice come up on the major league roster. One, um, he has to be put on the 40 man roster at the end of the year because he is rule five eligible. So you have to do that eventually if you're planning on keeping him. He's not on the 40 man now, so they would have to create a 40 man spot for him. You know, they have options there. They could put um, Clayton Andrews, a relief pitcher. They can DFA him. There, there are several candidates that you can move around to make it work um, to put Rice on the 40 man right now. Um, but again, they have to do it eventually. Now is a, is a great opportunity. I believe I said this. Uh, you know, at some point in early May, but because of where the Yankees are, like we know they're making the playoffs. So, you know, it's a good, it's a, it kind of is a free opportunity to see what you have in Rice. Um, you are making the playoffs, you know, how, how much worse can he be than Rizzo? Honestly, Rizzo's yep. been, Rizzo's been horrible. Yep. So even even if uh, Rice thinks like is he going to be like that much worse than what we saw with Rizzo? I don't know. Right. You know he he has shown on every level so far that he can hit. Um, you know he doesn't have years worth of experience defending at first base, so like maybe that's an issue. Um, but Rizzo's been a negative defender this year again. So how much worse can he be? It, it, cert, it certainly makes all the sense in the world to have Rice play, given what we've seen at first base this year. And again, we have, what, like six-ish weeks to the trade deadline at this point. And if Rice comes up and, you know, is playing every day and, you know, he sh he's shown that he can more than handle himself at the plate, maybe you don't need a first baseman. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but at least you have – some you know data points to base your decision off of so i am in full agreement that if rizzo has to miss significant time it should be rice there's no reason to have peraza up because the yankees have made it very clear they don't trust peraza and from their actions it doesn't seem like he has much of a spot moving forward on the future roster so there's no reason to have him up um, you know, they have TJ Rumfield, who's not who's probably not a major leaguer, but you know, as I said several weeks ago on here, the Yankees, from what they've been saying behind the scenes, they like Rice, they believe in Rice, they think he, he can be a really good hitter in the majors. Now is a really good opportunity to see what he you have in him. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. it it's just it also informs your trade deadline too, which I think is important. And beyond that, I just don't think it's prudent to put in two 
below average hitters on the corners when you could potentially have someone who gives average production at best based off of his performance in the minors. You know, if there's an opportunity to see what you have and there's a there's potential for Rice to give average to above average production in a short amount of time, you, you got to try it. I mean, we already know what we're getting with Oswaldo and LeMahieu. It's going to be below average production. And I'm trying to give LeMahieu the benefit of the doubt because he's playing catch up, but he's not hitting the ball hard. And I know you tweeted that he like can't even hit the ball 300 feet now outside of the one that he hit last night. So, I mean, just try it with Rice and see where we go. So, with that said, we're going to move on to the Baltimore series right after this break. And we're back. It's Randy. It's Chris. Before we talk about the Baltimore series, we were talking during the break about Fenway Park not even having the modern X-ray machine that you can just refer to as an X-ray machine. They have a fluoroscope that I'm pretty sure nobody knew what that was um, outside of the employees of the Boston Red Sox organization. <laughs> and um, we just thought it was funny that they have like the original X-ray machine apparently uh, stored at Fenway Park. Uh, yeah, I mean – when Boone said that, I was like, <laughs> I have no idea what – I've never heard of this word before. <laughs> so I, I certainly had to pull up Google and be like, um, I'm not going to ask what the hell a fluoroscope is. So yeah, I, I'm certainly going to have to look this up. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's definitely funny because, the, like, the Yankees have, you know, modern medical equipment <laughs> in, 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 like, their stadium. Right. So. Like if they if a guy needs like a an X ray, like they'll just say it's an X ray. Right. Um, the, the Red Sox have an iron lung next to yeah. the, floor, the fluoroscope. Yeah, that was a uh, that was pretty wild. That was like sneaky. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, is Rizzo going to survive this process? Like, and yeah, what? It's like what? What? What yeah. the hell did he have to do? Right. Like. Does he still have an arm uh, after going through the fluoroscope process? Yeah, um, seriously. Yeah. All right. So uh, Baltimore tomorrow. Today's an off day. So as you listen to this, um, hopefully here before the Oreo series, you won't be missing anything um, game wise. We've talked about the Dodgers series. We talked about a couple other series not being important in the long run. Um, just because National League teams are not division teams or division teams that you know, are not really going to compete with the Yankees to win the division this year. This is a big series. And I also want to say it's a big series for Baltimore, too, because there are both teams are me measuring stick for the other one. And I know that we're all involved in the Yankees day to day. <clears throat> Obviously, it's Chris's job uh, as a fan. You're invested every day. And we kind of get in that bubble. But this is also a test for Baltimore. And I was listening to their broadcast yesterday when the Orioles were playing the Phillies and their broadcast team acknowledged that as well for Baltimore. And they acknowledged how well the Yankees are playing. So I, I want to make sure that people understand that this is not David versus Goliath and the Yankees are David and like the little plucky team trying to beat the big bad Orioles. Both teams are great. Both teams in my opinion, or at the top of the league. I think that are two best teams in Major League Baseball right now. This is like a heavyweight clash. So it's a measuring test for the Yankees and the Orioles. But it is very important for a lot of reasons. And, you know, this is one of the rare instances where I think we have to acknowledge that um, this is going to be different from other series that the Yankees have had. Yeah, I mean, this – this series matters. Like the Dodgers series was cool. Obviously, a lot of excitement, especially nationally, you know, because, you know, East Coast, West Coast, possible World Series matchup, yada, yada. Um, but again, it didn't really matter for like the standings themselves. Like these three games against the Orioles matter um, because either the Yankees or the Orioles are going to win the AL East. The, Yan the, the Yankees have already lost three of four to the Orioles earlier in the season. And, you know, it's entirely possible that these these two teams could have 
the same record at the end of the year. And, you know, obviously the tiebreaker in that situation is head to head. So you, you want to win these games. This is certainly, you know, the most important series probably of the season so far, in my opinion, just with where we are in the season um, what's happened with the, the Yankees earlier in the year with the Orioles. So it, it's certainly a, a big matchup. You know, thankfully for the Yankees' perspective, if if you're curious, like they're avoiding their two best pitchers in Burns and Rodriguez. Both those guys pitched uh, a couple of days ago, Burns yesterday uh, against the Phillies. So they're avoiding them. But, you know, really top to bottom – the Orioles are really, really good. Yeah. They're, they don't have many flaws. And the scary part, if you're a Yankees fan, is the Orioles can be even better next month if they decide, hey, like we can win the World Series and our farm system is absolutely loaded. They have the best farm system in baseball. Let's, let's add whoever. Right. You want to add Garrett Crochet from the White Sox? Cool. We have the pieces to do that. Um, you know, you want to add Pete Alonzo? I'm, I'm just throwing out names. Cool. We can do that because it doesn't matter because we have the prospect capital. The Orioles should be a very big concern for the Yankees just because they're already good and they can get even better at any moment because of the amount of talent they have in the minor leagues and on their major league roster, if they wanted to move some of these guys around too, like, you know, they have a lot of talent in both the major league level and the minor league level. And that really should be a concern, not only for the Yankees, but entire the entire MLB. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the aspect of the Yankees that feels like it sets them apart from everybody else. Um, because in, in my opinion, they have pitching questions. Um, and I think there are legitimate questions, especially like with the injuries that they've had. They probably need to get at least one starter to get through the rest of the season and help them in the playoffs. Uh, Bradish is back on the IL with elbow issues, means pitch, then he got hurt. Um, I believe one other pitcher of theirs is hurt as well. Kramer, right? Tyler Wells had a Tyler elbow, Wells, right. 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 So um, I think the guys that have filled in for them have done pretty well. Um, but this is a team, obviously, with World Series aspirations. They're going to need to address their pitching. Also, Craig Kimbrell's in the back. And, I mean, they they need to help out their bullpen as well. But the thing is, they're more than capable of addressing – those issues um i i also find um i guess cedric mullins is starting to pick it up a little bit but they have good outfielders but it feels like they could also like try to improve there as well if they wanted to i know they have Kowser, um austin hayes hasn't been great uh santander had like a slow starter like a rough patch but he's like hitting really well now mullins he's he's just starting to hit um so the Orioles have some holes like the Yankees, but they're like really capable, obviously, of like filling in as many of those holes as they feel like they need to or want to. Um, so that's like the Yankees have the ammunition as well, but obviously they don't have what the Orioles have. Nobody does. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the Yankees uh, pitching matchups uh, going into this. And of course, um, I believe Cortez goes tomorrow and then. The, the day and date and letters that everybody is focusing on is Wednesday, June 19th, TBD. And um, there is a at least a possibility that TBD turns into Garrett Cole. So um, what are your thoughts on the chances of that happening based on what guys have said um, after Cole's last rehab start um i know that whether he pitches in new york or he pitches in scranton or somerset wherever that he won't be fully built up so you can't really expect him to just 
throw 100 plus pitches in his first outing because he's just not there yet. Um, but what does your gut tell you about Cole pitching against Baltimore this week? Yeah, I mean, he said that because it's the Baltimore series, like he said that it, it didn't even cross his mind. I don't know if I believe that. You know, it's it's certainly, again, it's the biggest series. I don't believe that for a second. He knows yeah. exactly who they're playing. Yeah, exactly. Um, he said it didn't cross his mind. I don't believe it. It it, it surely had to cross his mind. Um, like you said, if, if he did pitch in the Bronx on Wednesday, um, you know, he pitched – he had 70 pitches in his last outing in uh, AAA – you would expect he would probably be somewhere around 80 to 85 in this outing. Um, We asked Boone this the other day, you know, they don't have any reservations about calling him up to the Yankees. If he's not at a hundred pitches, like they're totally fine. If he's at 80 or 85, Um, the thing, if you do that too, is, you know, let's say Garrett gets in trouble. He can't get through four innings because he's already reached his pitch count, you know, then you might burn the bullpen for, you know, the rest of the series. You have the Braves come into town. The Braves are obviously good too. Um, you know, obviously those factors weigh into their decision of having him start on Wednesday in the Bronx. Um, if I were to bet, I probably would lean toward him playing Wednesday in the Bronx just because, you know, it's the Orioles. You want your best players playing, and Garrett's obviously one of their best players. He probably gives them a better a better chance of winning than Cody Poteet, who has pitched well. But, you know, they're obviously on different levels, Cole and Poteet. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know what's going to happen right now. But if I were to guess, I would lean toward him starting Wednesday in the Bronx. I would be surprised if he – doesn't pitch against the Orioles. I mean, I think he was <clears throat> he was so good in that rehab start that I'm not sure. Obviously, I'm not having conversations with him. You're closer to the team than I am. Uh, I don't think there's much left in those rehab starts stuff-wise for him to, like, tinker with or not feel comfortable with. I know the second start, he wasn't happy with his two-seamer. And he wanted to work on that, and it felt like he worked on it and it helped him in the last rehab start. So unless there is another pitch that he feels like he needs to refine in another rehab start, that feels like the only reason for him not to pitch against Baltimore on Wednesday. And I watched some of that start um, in Rochester, and for my like untrained eye, everything looked good. I mean, it, it didn't seem like he was struggling with a particular pitch. It felt like his command was there. He was like really aggressive um, against the hitters. So that one felt like this is my final tune up. Let me ramp this up and get ready to to pitch with the Yankees after this one. You know what I mean? It, it just felt like the way he approached that start was let me push it now. Let me get back to that like game time competitive aggression and not like feel my way through these pitches. Let me just go after them and see what happens. And Obviously, he got through it fine physically, but it also feels just like performance and stuff wise, the the overall arsenal was like in a better place. Um, and it, it just felt like to me, this was my final tune up before I go with the Yankees. So I would be surprised if he doesn't pitch. Um, you know, anything can happen, but I, I just felt like that was the, you know, I'm ready to go now, start. Um, And let me prove it to myself and the organization so that they're comfortable enough. And I think you make a good point about the potential of him not pitching well against Baltimore and the impact on the pen. But, I I mean, I think you take that risk with Garrett Cole 10 out of 10 times. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he's just going to go with it. And I think, you know, being at home, going up against a really good team, divisional battle, I mean, I think Cole will be ready for it and – you know, he'll be at his best for what his best is at that particular time. So I would I would take that risk if he's ready to go and he feels like his stuff is in the place where he can get major league hitters out. Um, so I would 
I would also bet that he pitches on Wednesday. And it'll be very nice to see potentially Cole and Heel go back to back. Like that yes. that would be fun. Like now you're starting to there's a chance for you to see what the future and the rest of the season could look like when you have these two guys going back to back against teams and you know how difficult that might be for opposing teams when they have to face the Yankees in a series. Yeah, that would certainly be fun and and you know gives you a sneak peek of what it could look like in October because as of now, you know, Garrett's obviously pitching game one. And then you probably want heel game two. You yep. know, heel's obviously been their best pitcher this season. Um yep. so yeah, it would certainly be fun. Um again, if I was betting, I would say Garrett is gonna pitch on Wednesday in the Bronx. Um I don't know what I would put the odds at. Maybe plus one twenty-five. Like I don't. I, I think there's certainly some um, reservations you'd have about you know not having him for the reasons I said. You know, if he can't get through Baltimore, it affects the pen. You know, he could he could always pitch um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So it would be. I think they have off Monday, so he would pitch Tuesday against the Mets at City Field. You know, less stakes. Obviously, you want to beat the Mets. I get it. Doesn't really matter for the standings, but they could do that if they wanted. Um, but it 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 totally makes sense to have your best players play in a very important series, and this is a very important series, and you want Garrett Cole playing in that series. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if he's ready to go, he's got a pitch. I mean, it's just how he feels and where he thinks his stuff at is at. Um, but yeah, I mean, you gotta let the Orioles know who you are. You know, like this is one of those statement series. They they threw their first punch um in the series in April. It's time for the Yankees to throw a punch back, especially after that Boston series, where again I felt like they were not the aggressor. And I I thought they played on their heels the last two games. You can't do that against Baltimore, like especially at home. You gotta go after them. So you know, throwing Cole out there is one of one of the ways to go after them. You have to make a statement and let them know that this is your division. You're the Yankees. You're the best team in the league, in the division, all those things. And you have to be the aggressor. And, and that also includes aggressive decision making if your pitcher feels like he's ready to go. So and I, I think if he says yes, he's going to pitch. I mean, I, just, I think. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's Garrett's good. decision. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Matt Blake's. It's not Aaron Boone's. Right. Like if. Garrett has that cachet where if he wants to pitch in New York on Wednesday, he is pitching. Right. And no one is stopping him. Right. There's Matt also Blake ain't stopping him. There's also that uh shot of him on the uh the dugout railing in Fenway where he was just like stewing. He was just like heated. And I'm like, oh yeah, man, you gotta pitch on Wednesday, dude. Like you're you don't like this. <laughs> you gotta yeah, get going, I, man. I, I know which uh shot yeah you're talking. He was like sitting like like this, yeah. if you're watching the YouTube. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, he obviously wants to be out there. It's obviously been a frustrating process for him to not be out there. So, you know, it's certainly a good opportunity for him to make the season debut in a very, very big spot. And you, you obviously know Garrett likes playing in these spots. Right. Okay. So after the break, we will get to the mailbag and our first ever big time rant from I'm assuming as a listener. Um, but yeah, we will get to that right after this break. It's mailbag time. Actually, it's rant time for one person who let me check the time of when this email was sent to us. 12.42 a.m. <laughs> so this is well after <laughs> the Yankee Red Sox game ended. So my man was definitely stewing over this. Um, Chris took the liberty of counting the words in this email, in this rant, and it's 411 words. And you're going to listen to every single one of them, including the subject of this email. So 
from Osvaldo Alcantara. Oh, hold on. I just totally butchered his name. I didn't do that on purpose. Osvaldo Alcantara S. The subject. The Yankees are a disgrace. Good night, Chris, and the other guy. <laughs> I don't know Osvaldo. Maybe he has a burner on Twitter and he and I got into it, but I don't know why I got a shot for no reason. I'm like, I'm like the 50 cent <laughs> meme all of a sudden. Um, I did nothing to Osvaldo that I'm aware of. Oh, anyway, man. that's my name moving forward. No question from me. This is just a warning to the Yankees, and I hope you share this to the world and whole social media. I don't care. Truth will be written here. This sentence is in bold, so everybody knows. This Yankees team is a disgrace. The bold ends there. They have never been heavily exposed against better competition, and now they're getting exposed against the red enemy. Parentheses. They continue to bend over Alex Cora. End of parentheses. I don't know what that means. This team has two great hitters, Judge and Soto, two average players, Verdugo and Volpe, and six horrendous players in the lineup. That's 10 players, not nine. So I'm not sure how the <laughs> math works there, but the Yankees have a 10 player rule that nobody else adheres to. So they have 10 horrendous players in the lineup. That was my uh, little addition to the email. Back to the email. This team is not deep. They have reinforcements in the minors who could help the infield and they just refuse to do it. Now, with Rizzo being injured, that's a possibility, finally. More bold. The pitching staff has come back down to earth. End of the bold. This was so good to be true. They were never this good. Look at the savant pages of most of these pitchers. A lot of blue. Heel is clearly gassing. And now this team is rushing Garrett Cole back because a collapse is on the wings? Question mark. Garrett Cole went 70 pitches, four and a third innings pitch against a triple-A team. He's not built to come back, and you will throw him to the fire against the best team in baseball. More bold. This team has the shades of 2022 and 2023. End of bold. This team is going to collapse right off the gate. There's no game changers out there at the deadline who can make this team a championship caliber team. The Yankees won't do anything. Do you guys know who will? The Orioles. They are the best team in baseball, not the Yankees, Phillies, or Dodgers, who lost bets in Yamamoto to injuries. There was a reason I wasn't sold on this team. This 22-2023 cologne is hidden somewhere, but I could <laughs> smell it these past two days. That is an incredible line. That, that, is, amazing. that, is, that is great. Shout out to Osvaldo for that one. That was good. They're going to lose the series to the Orioles and Braves, and the collapse will carry until the end of the season. More bold. My preseason spring training projection was 90, 94 wins. Now, all this is in parentheses. Even though I took a break from the Yankees at the end of 2022 because I was having a hard time mentally, and now I tried to believe in them, and this is what I got, question mark, end of parentheses. I think I cooked on my prediction. Okay. <laughs> this team is fraudulent. They will never be serious. They will never beat the allegations of fraudulency. <laughs> the season will be a disappointment again, and the vicious circle will continue. Just tear it down, please. Osvaldo Alcantara S. M. D. Before That's we the get best into that's that the is best the best. Part. Yeah, that's, that's the, the best, best part, part because this doctor at twelve forty-five in the morning was so pissed at what he watched. You know, he's it's it. Today's Monday too, so I assume he's I assume he's in the office today. I assume he was up early. I am very so concerned about his pissed. patient. He was so pissed that he was like, "Screw this shit." I am not getting sleep tonight because the Yankees have ruined my mood and now my patients will feel my wrath 
tomorrow morning when I'm in the office. Well, okay. I'm not trying to kill anybody's business. Certainly not. I don't know where he's a doctor, what he, what medicine he practices, none of that. And I'm sure he's a great doctor because he just dropped gems throughout that entire uh, email, including not knowing my name. Uh, I would suggest to his patients to reschedule the appointment <laughs> for a time when the Yankees are on a winning streak. So this man does not put your health at risk because <laughs> he's not happy. He is focused on other things right now. And for your physical well-being, you might want to give him some time to, like, come back down to earth. And I would advocate um, your health being first and rescheduling with with the doctor, the good doctor Osvaldo, and um, you know, let him calm down a little bit because that email and rant was intense and a lot of effort was put into it because the bolding every time I went to a bowl, so people know, um, it was a new paragraph. So um, this was well thought out. And if you ever like bold in an email, you are, are serious because even trying to bold the email is like a pain in the ass. So, um, cause I don't think everybody does, um, command B <laughs> to do uh bold. So, uh, yeah. Thoughts on Osvaldo's, uh, email. I'm just like picturing his patients who he's recommended, you know, a diet change too, or, uh, you know, you need to be more active. And then they come in the next appointment and they're either worse or they didn't take his recommendations. He's like, this is the worst help I've ever seen in my, in my practice. Yeah. Uh, horrible. You have pre-diabetes and you're still eating cookies. You're still drinking fruit juice. It's the worst. It's it's amazing. I mean, just the fact that it's a doctor too who was so worked <laughs> up. Like, I, I hope he got an EKG exactly. this morning to like check his heart. Yeah, his uh, his nursing assistants or nurses need to give him a uh, might have to have the CPR equipment. Um, I mean, seriously, go. or yeah, the, get, uh, get the, the paddles. Yeah, get the defibrillator out. <laughs> exactly. Like, okay, I just want to. I don't have a response to that specifically, but some some of the points he was making certainly like check out. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, for sure. Yeah, you know, like we were just saying, the Orioles can make any move they wanted. You know, the Yankees have a minor leaguer in Ben Rice who you know certainly makes sense to call up if Rizzo is hurt. Like some of the points were certainly valid but to to be that worked up again over one series is you know it's absurd yeah i mean that, that that's the thing about the email that is great he makes points like they're valid points like we've talked about it like we're not in disagreement at all like you know we've we've talked about it we talked about it on this episode so there was definitely like a level of rationality there because He's right. The rest of it, though, is just like, what? Are you okay, man? Like, what's happening? Like, it's not that serious. Like, the team is good. I, this just speaks to a larger thing that I, I don't understand. And I don't know if this is online fandom. I don't know if this is, like, fandom in general. And I want to be very clear here. <clears throat> I don't want to paint, like, a broad brush for every Yankees fan sports fan i don't want to do that because i think in many cases these are vocal minorities that like act out this way but even within that minority i don't understand the the overreactions to two games in a season that has 162 games they played two bad games like we acknowledge that they played two bad games they were not good games they deserved to lose them they earned the losses like the team did not do well but you're playing 162 games. That is going to happen. It's going to happen again. They're going to play bad games again. That's true for any team. The Orioles, the Dodgers, the Braves, 
Phillies. The Phillies look terrible in Baltimore. They got outclassed the uh, in two of those games, just like the Yankees did. And, and the Phillies, the Phillies just lost uh, the series to the Red Sox. They they right. lost the series against the Red Sox, and then traveled to the Orioles and, and lost that one too. Right. These these are professional baseball players that they're playing against. I don't understand why every game and it and it's been happening more and more as the years go by where every game merits these overreactions that are just ridiculous and then people get like personal about stuff with other people like what is your problem? It's not that serious. It's two games. It's okay. They're going to play another good game. They're 26 games above 500. They're going to lose games. And in fact, these are two rare games this season where they just did not play well and didn't really have – even then they had chances to win the games. But in pretty much every game this year, win or loss, they've been in those games. You know, like the Red Sox pulled away after the seventh inning or on the in the bottom of the seventh inning. We just talked about Glaber. He could have put them ahead. They're in these games. They're not getting embarrassed to the point where it's like they have no shot and like you don't want to be a fan anymore. I just don't understand the general overreactions to every game. I don't know if this is like engagement bait. I don't know if like people have and I don't I mean this with respect. I'm not trying to like downplay this or like insult anyone. I don't know if there are like other things going on in people's lives where like sports becomes an outlet for them to like express frustration. Like, and if that's the case, that's different. I understand there's everybody goes through stuff, but like, I'm trying to get to the heart of why people feel so strongly when teams lose a regular season game to the point where they're nasty to other people. I'm not even talking about towards me. I see how people interact with each other and it's like, this is so unnecessary. Like, there's a level of respect and like kindness you can give to people. It's just sports. Like, relax. I don't understand. Like, to write that email in general, I, it just feels like, why? <laughs> like, this is not necessary. I don't. It's two games in June. It's all right. It, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I, I, I don't understand the overreactions. It's not, it's not football. Football, every game matters. You know, there's only you're only playing 17 games, 18 games now. No, 17 games. It'll be 18 soon. It'll be 18 soon for guys. sure. Yeah. yeah. So like every game matters and every game is an event. That's why football partly is so popular because every game matters. Um, but baseball, it's like, like you said, you know, the Yankees are going to lose a series in August to like the Tigers. Right. And people are going to be like, what the hell? Right. What the hell is going on? It, it just, it, it happens. And I think your point of like them being in basically every game is also important. You're not in every game. If you're a bad team, right? <clears throat> you're just not, you're going to lose those games. And, and you're also going to be embarrassed more often than not. If you're a bad team, the Yankees, they may have had like, five games, maybe even less that like, all right, they're, they're just not winning today, which is pretty remarkable considering, you know, we're almost at the halfway point of the season and there's only been like five ish games where, all right. Yeah. Like the Yankees is just, they don't have it today. They're going to lose. Right. It's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it, it's also this idea that, you should be overly critical of the team that you support and to say that that's okay. I don't think that's okay. I think it's appropriate when it is merited to do such a thing, but to just sit there and feel like you have license to criticize a team, criticize other fans, go after the media and beat reporters of those teams just because you're supposedly a fan of that team I find unacceptable. The Yankees are good. The Yankees have issues. It is okay to talk about those issues, certainly. But when you get beyond that and start like 
their disgrace and bringing up past seasons that have nothing to do with this year. Now we're like crossing the line. You know what I mean? And then like taking shots at people for no reason. Like it's not that serious, but also they're good. Like, what is the problem here? Every team has issues. So like, we know what the issues are. People acknowledge them. Nobody's running away from it. That doesn't give you license to just be overly critical of everything involved with the team. Like, it's okay to like be happy that the team is good and there is potential for them to get better. Like, that's how I look at it. Yes, they need to improve the corner infield spots. Yes, they need to improve the bullpen. But to me, that shows there is room to be even better than what they are right now, which is scary for the league. If the Yankees get better, it's more difficult for them to lose to these teams. So that's not a bad thing. They haven't peaked. They're not going to be the same team in two months that they are now. They're going to make a move. So to me, that's encouraging. Like They're doing that well with these obvious holes. And there's a chance for them to get even better. Like, why? What's the problem? I don't. I would sign up for that every year if I know that my team was like had the best record in baseball and still can get better. Like, I know they haven't peaked yet. What's the so? What's the issue? What are you mad about? Like, what's the problem here? I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. But I think that's enough with the yeah. rant. I think we covered it well. I, I hope you, you feel better, Osvaldo, and I hope your patients are okay. <laughs> All right. Tim Jennings, question about the catching tandem. Hey, guys, been enjoying the podcast. <laughs> it's nice to hear from level-headed Yankees fans to offset the emotional fans on Twitter. Keep up the good work. I wonder if Tim and Osvaldo were, like, in cahoots together. Had a question about the current catching tandem. It seems like recently Boone is playing Trevino more than Wells as opposed to the straight platoon of Wells versus right-handed pitching and Trevino versus left-handed pitching we saw to begin the season. This question is more towards Chris since he's around the team. Has there been a change in how the team views the catching tandem? Is offense being prioritized or we're trying to get Wells back going since Trevino is now usually playing two or three games in a series? Yeah, I mean, they they've been doing this for – um, I want to say like a, at least a month now. Um, Trevino's clearly like the number one catcher. Um, you know, going into the season and, and even at the start of the season, it, it certainly seemed like there was a split where it was one A, one B. But it, it from how they've been playing, it's really Trevino's one, Wells is two. Um, and as Tim mentioned, like, you know, Wells hasn't been playing that much. He played uh, once against the Red Sox, twice against the Royals, once against the Dodgers, twice against the Twins, twice against the Giants, once against the Angels. So, yeah, I mean, like, there's clearly, you know, he's clearly the backup catcher at this point. Um, I, I forget where we were, but Boone made a point. It was certainly on the road, but Boone made a point of um, it might have been Anaheim. Um, I think it was Anaheim. I think the Angels started two lefties in that series, if I remember correctly. And he was like, yeah, Trevino's playing basically because of that reason, which is offense. Um, they certainly, uh, they certainly believe in both guys' ability to defend. They're really good at framing. We obviously discussed them not, um, having the strongest arms. So it, it certainly seems like the separator right now is offense. And to his credit, Trevino has been a good hitter this year. He has a, I think he had like a 110. I don't have the numbers right in front of me. I think he has like a 110 WRC plus this year. Um, you know, he is a platinum glove award winner. He's really good with pitchers. Um, the entire pitching staff trusts him. But obviously, again, last night showed that, you know, he certainly has a big flaw in his game, which is his arm. Um, but yeah, he's Wells, at a, sorry, he's at a one nineteen WRC, which is really good, really good. Uh, so yeah, like there's there's certainly problems with both guys. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about Wells and his bat, of like how hard he was hitting the ball. 
like on this on the whole, like yeah, he's been hitting the ball hard. Definitely seems like he's tailed off a little bit um, yeah. lately with the bat. He just hasn't had the results this year to warrant more playing time. You know, we're in we're in mid June now. At some point, like you have to say, we have a good, really good option here with Trevino, who should probably get most of the at bats. Yeah, I mean. Trevino's slash line is 271, 317, 451. And his F war is one and a half, 1.5. So, I mean, and he has a WRC plus of 119. Like, he's the starter. I mean, and he's yeah. contributing. And I, yeah. I know the throwing thing, I know the thrower thing is an issue because, or like a uh, subject of conversation because of what happened over the weekend. But like, he's an incredible defensive catcher. Like the throwing aside, he's he's one of the best, obviously. So I think the Yankees will live with the throwing stuff because he brings so much more to the table and he's hitting and he's had some big hits. You know what I mean? So I, I think Trevino's the clear starter. I think he's having a really good season. Um, definitely a big bounce back from last year. So I mean, they the Yankees don't have a catching issue regardless of like how people feel about the throwing, like that's not the most important thing in the world. So they're getting offensive production from Trevino, great game calling and outside of the throwing really good defense. So, I mean, I, I don't have anything to criticize. Like I could get over the throwing. It's, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's certainly a big deal. Like I, I'm, I'm not downplaying his inability to throw guys out. Like that, that could that could be exposed by faster teams pretty easily if he's behind the plate. Um, but there's so much more that goes into being yeah, a catcher. I, yeah, I mean, I know that it's there, but that's like towards the bottom of my list of priorities for a catcher. Oh, you know no I mean? doubt. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean it in that context. Like, yeah, you don't want the teams running all over you and, and getting nine stolen bases like that's absurd but like if we're talking about Trevino on the whole like if his one weakness is throwing runners out you know okay that's better than not being able to call a game or frame like he's 100%. stealing yeah I mean he's 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 impacting the game with his framing way more than he's like taking away from the game because he's not throwing out a base runner yeah so and and that's important to note for fans. Like you see like the stolen bases. So like, that's easy to be like, Oh, what the hell? Like we need to trade for a catcher now because this guy has, he has a noodle arm. Right. But he, there's so much more that goes into it. Right. He's stealing outs and strikes left and right. Like that's more important. Like, I don't know. I'll, I'll take that in the offensive production and they can figure out the throwing, you know, maybe they, they the, the pitchers also have to like help them out. Not, not that it's the pitcher's fault, but they might just have to help them out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Also, if you go to Wells, he can't throw either. So, I mean, you're still in the same situation. Yeah, same, th same thing. <laughs> if these are your two catchers on the roster, they have the same flaw. They have a weak arm. They're both good at framing. Both guys have trust in the pitching staff. One guy is hitting better than the other. That's right. the separator between them right now. Yeah, and – Trevino hit a home run last night. So, um, yeah. Next question from Jamie Sullivan. After the Red Sox series, and especially the final game, do you think the deadline priorities have changed for the Yankees' front office? Did a high strikeout reliever become more as important as infield help? Love the pod and love the articles. Chris, thanks, Jamie from Worcester. Wait, I don't even know if I – I know, like, all these, like, towns and cities and – uh, Massachusetts have like odd pronunciation, so sorry if I like mispronounced I, the. I think it's Worcester. It's Worcester, right? That's Worcester, right? Yeah, Worcester. That's Worcester. Yeah. Uh, My bad. I'm sorry from Worcester. Yeah, because that is the one city, town, whatever it is that uh is pronounced yeah. nothing like the way it's spelled. So I'm sorry. I apologize, Worcester. Yeah, my friend uh lives in the Boston area. He got a house in uh. W O B U R N. So I thought it was Woburn. It's uh -huh. Woburn. Right. Massachusetts. Just there's a lot going on there. Stupid, st stupid yeah. stuff. <laughs> stupid stuff. Uh, 
That's, that's why we live in New York. Yeah, just pronounce the damn word like exactly. How it's exactly. The hell is that shit? Why is this more complicated than it needs to be? <laughs> um, um, but no, to answer the question, no, they're not gonna, you know, change their plans around because of one series. And also, we've been discussing the 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 needs for the Yankees before the series started. So, like, no, like again, if like you were if you were reacting to the series in just just in a vacuum, the three games, like you would probably say, like, oh yeah, like the Yankees need a starting pitcher, like a top of the line starter, because you know these guys didn't perform well. You, you need a, you need another catcher. We we got exposed, so you know we got to trade these guys to get someone else in. Um, you need a whole know. new team, apparently. Yeah, after yeah. Their last I mean, games. basically. So no, like they wouldn't change their plans around. Like you know, anyone who's watching this team on a day to day basis, which obviously the organ organization is, like knows what needs to be done to upgrade the roster. And right. if they don't see that the bullpen and corner infield should be improved, if possible, then you know the organization has bigger problems, right? Because that's been that's been what the Yankees have needed for several weeks now, right? Okay, Arthur Blainville, hi right, guys. What would be your unexpected move at the tra trade deadline? Mine would be. <clears throat> I'm not going to go for some like big name, just say like, Oh, Mike Trout when he's healthy or something like that. Uh, mine would actually be Isaac Paredes from the race. Um, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I don't think he's going to get traded. I don't think he's going to get traded to the Yankees, but if they could get Paredes to play third, that to me would be a very nice addition. Um, I'm not off the top of my head so sure if he's having as good of a year as he had last year. But he is. He can hit. Yeah, I he mean, can. he's a he's a good player. Like that was a great trade for the Rays, and he's a really good player. I'd love to have him on the Yankees. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but I I think he would solve a major issue for the Yankees if they were able to get Parady. So he would be my unexpected one if I had to choose that doesn't involve like just, you know, cheating and trading for like, I don't know, the Julio Rodriguez or somebody. The only thing with Parady is it's, it would cost a ton to get right. him. Yeah. Uh, he's not a free agent until 2028. The race certainly could move him. Um, that's what they do. They sell high on guys and that's how they build their team. Um, I'm not saying it's the right way or the wrong way to do it. The, the Rays have had a lot of success doing it their way. And a lot of teams poach their front office because they're, they're viewed as very, very smart. Um, but yeah, if the Yankees got for 80s, it would cost a lot. You're yeah. probably talking Spencer Jones being in there. Yep. Ben like multiple top top prospects, multiple top 10 prospects. And even then it's probably a little short just because, you know, he is under team control until 2028. And if I'm the Rays, honestly, like the Rays are not the Rays probably aren't making the playoffs this year. But if you look at what they have coming next year, their team is probably going to be really good. Yeah. Uh, so Paredes is someone I would try to keep. Um, I would probably try to move Randy Rosarena if I was the Rays. Yep. You know, obviously he hasn't been been good this year, but you know, if you're judging off of past performance, you know, it's probably likely he'll bounce back at some point. Um, but yeah, like if I'm the Rays, Paredes is someone I would want to keep. To answer the question, like I don't have like someone off the top of my mind. One guy who I was actually thinking about, um, like when Rizzo went down and, and them needing a first baseman, everybody's favorite player from this past offseason. Oh, I, I I was going to bring him up. Go ahead. Yeah. Cody Bellinger? Yep. Yep. I was just <laughs> going to bring him up too. He was my yeah. second choice to mention. Yeah. Um, 
the Cubs are weird this year. Like they don't, they don't really have an incentive to sell. They have a really big payroll. Everybody in the national league is still in the race to be in, in the playoffs. And as we've seen, if you're in the playoffs, you have a chance to win in, in this expanded playoff era. So I don't know if they would sell. He, I think he has a an opt out after this year, so it's possible he he could be a uh, rental. It's after 2025. So it's a two year deal. Yeah. Um, the Yankees are probably going to need a first baseman next year. I, I, with how he's performed, you know, he probably should decline. Rizzo's option at the end at the end of the season and, and pay him his six million dollar buyout. He's just not playing like a seventeen million dollar player. That's what he would cost next year. Um, I don't know. That would, that would be uh, interesting. Yeah, he was he was definitely second on my uh, my list. I just like really I like Paredes more, but um, yeah, same. Uh, yeah, Bellinger would be a very interesting and unexpected deal. I just feel like the Yankees know they need a corner infielder and they're downplaying their interest in that market. Um, Because, you know, all the reporting that's coming out now is they're only focused on the bullpen and like strikeout guys. And it's like, yeah, obviously that's a, a need, but so is corner infield. I mean, everybody knows that at this point and it's just very hard to believe that the Yankees don't know that either and that they won't be going for it. You know, it's I just- also think it's important to note that if they were to come out and say, yeah, like we want to upgrade corner infield, you have two veterans who are yeah. respected in the clubhouse. Right. So you come out and say that and you're like, well, what the hell? Right. You know, you don't like us. You don't like, you don't like our guys in here. Right. So like, of, of course they're, they wouldn't come out and say like, yes, we want to, we want to upgrade Anthony Rizzo's spot. Right. We want to upgrade DJ LeMayu's spot. Like, right. <clears throat> yeah, I would be surprised if they came out and were were saying that. Yeah, yeah, they're they're definitely going after somebody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's just hard to believe that they wouldn't be. I mean, this is that is the one position player profile that just stands out like a sore thumb. And if they can plug that hole, that lineup's really tough to beat. I mean, I'm I'm higher on the lineup outside of Judge and Soto than most because I'm still clinging on to Glaber, figuring things out and getting better as the season goes on. And also, I just firmly believe they're, they're adding at the deadline to one of these positions. So I'm admittedly going off of an assumption of something that could or could not happen. And I'm choosing to believe something will happen. Um, And maybe it's a combination of rice playing well, if he comes up and in addition, I just think that in, and we've talked about this in years where the Yankees are good. The Yankees front office is aggressive in making moves and bringing in players to tell the team, look, we recognize what you've done. We believe you can win. We got some pieces. Now go out and finish the job. That's the MO under Cashman. So I find it hard to believe that they're not going to be aggressive in the market to address these these holes. So I believe in the lineup. I certainly do not agree with the idea that it's just Judge and Soto. Like the the field goal posts are constantly moving here. First it was it was just Soto and everybody else. Then it was Judge and and judge and everybody else. Now it's judge and Soto and everybody else. It's like, okay, let's stop playing this game and doing this like doom and gloom thing. Like the lineup is, is it one through nine, like a juggernaut? No. Is it more than two guys? Absolutely. I mean, come on, let, let's not, let's not keep playing this game. Like, I, I, just, I just think that that's like low hanging fruit, like silliness that we need to get over. You, you can't lead the league in runs with two guys. Like even last night, the the bases loaded situation, Judge and Soto didn't even bat in that inning. Like they were nowhere to be found. They they were not part of that inning. So how do you have bases loaded, no out, and three opportunities to score if other guys aren't doing something? Like they had to get on base. You know what I mean? Like it didn't they didn't score runs, obviously, but like they created traffic. 
You know what I mean? It's just, come on. There's no guarantee that Judge and Soto were going to come through in those situations either. You would bank that they would. But, you know, like you don't lead the run the league in runs with two guys. Like whether you have nine guys hitting or ten guys hitting, according to some people. So, I mean, let's 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 give a little credit to the team. Like they're they're good. It's just it's like exhausting to like constantly see that sentiment as if like they're the Marlins. They're not the Marlins. It's okay. They're they're having a good year. The Yankees are top five in batting average. They're second in on base percentage and they're third in slugging. And, you know, obviously that's helped because Soto and Judge are having good seasons, but you need more than two guys to be top five in all those categories. Yeah, like, I mean, come on. That's just basic math. Like, what are we doing here? I don't – it's just it, – it's it's weird. Like, they have a guy that has 17 home runs. Now, does he look foolish on sliders? Yes. He's always looked foolish on sliders. He won an MVP looking like like he's never seen a pitch before. He won an MVP that way. He frustrated the greatest hitter of all time when he was a hitting coach with the Marlins. Like, that's who John Carlos Stan is. But he also has 17 home runs, and he has, like, an above-average WRC+. plus. Like, we've talked numerous times about Volpe being an impactful player at the top of the lineup. Verdugo, Verdugo won a game by himself on Friday. Like, he won the game for them. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess that's, like, the theme of this episode. It's okay. They're a good team. We don't need to, you know, crush the team because they lost two games. It's all right. I did. This episode's running long, so maybe if uh, this continues next week or this week, I should say. Are we sure Volpe's good with the bat? What do you mean? Are we sure he's are, are we sure he's you know someone you want at the top of the order? Yes. I don't, I don't know. I, I, really? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, since right, we'll to... yeah, it's getting long. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think he's having a weird offensive season. That um, he doesn't walk. He's basically a singles hitter now. I don't know if he's sold out too much to have a contact bat. I, I don't think know. I think that's I think that's exactly what it is. Like I I think he's never going to be a typical leadoff guy who walks to get on base. He's going to swing the bat. So I think that's who he is. I think the thing right now is that he's overcorrected too much to the contact side, and I've said this before. I think once he finds that balance between good contact and when to like, like try to drive the ball, he'll be like even more dynamic than he is now. But I think he's sacrificed power to overcorrect to get the contact. I think that's exactly what it is. And he's yeah. never going to, he's not a walk guy. Like that's just, I don't see him getting to the point where he drives his own base percentage up because all of a sudden he's laying off a bunch of pitches. Maybe years down the road, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I mean, the one thing with that is like, if you're not walking, then you, you should be trying to hit the ball with more authority then. And right. I agree. You know, he's not hitting the ball. He doesn't hit the ball hard. Um, you know, he's obviously the approach this year, obviously is I'm going to hit the ball to right field and, you know, hopefully I'll find grass, but I, I don't know if that's a, I don't know if it's the best strategy, truthfully. Um, you, know, you know, having him on base in front of Soto and Judge is a good thing because if they hit it in the gap or if he steals, then it's a quick one nothing game, which we've obviously seen a lot of. But it, it's just a weird, I, I would say it's just a weird offensive season for Volpe. Um, you yeah, know, he, you know, I, but he I, hit twenty plus homers last year, and like I said, he's obviously selling out for contact. But you have to, you also have to make sure the contact is good. Yeah, I mean, but I think that's the evolution of a young player. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm not saying he's gonna, you know, he's yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. 
the thing that was in my mind is like last night the broadcast was like, you know, they they lumped Volpe in with Henderson and Witt. Like Volpe is nowhere close to those two guys. I'm sorry to Yankee fans listening. He's nowhere in their he's not in their stratosphere. Henderson right. and, and Witt are top ten players in the sport. Volpe is nowhere close to being top ten. That, right. That's, yeah. Yeah, I no, I agree. I don't, agree. I don't I think don't. that's controversial. No, I think that's right. I think that's accurate. Um, but I think he's I think he's been a very good player though. Like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying he's I'm not, I'm not saying he's bad. Yeah, I I don't right. I wouldn't question his offense because he's not Witt or Henderson. Like, so I, I guess I think he's made like a great impact on this team. And I think he's he's figuring things out that Gunner and Bobby Witt either didn't have to figure out because it's just they're just that great of a player, or they figured out these things quicker than Volpe did. So um, they're also better players, but I also think just like the approach and attitude when you get in into the batter's box is different. And I, I think I think Volpe will figure it out. I just don't know when that would be. I don't know if that's the second half. I don't know if that's next year. But, I mean, even if you look quickly at his, like, Savant page, like, it, it clearly shows that, like, he was making harder contact last year. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but I mean, he, he had a power approach last year, and, yeah. and I was just I was just looking since April fifteenth, he has an eighty eight WRC plus and a two eighty six on base percentage, um, and that's over two months now, where he's yeah. been a below average hitter. It's just yeah, a weird. I mean, it's just, it's a weird season for him because there are games where he certainly looks great, but on the whole, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think he just needs to find the sweet spot. Yeah, like I think. Again, he's not going to walk. Like, I'm not expecting him to walk much. So, I think he just needs to find the sweet spot of when you drive the ball and when you need contact. I mean, I, I think that – I think his metrics, like, bear that out too. So – and also maybe, like, even with his new swing path, maybe he's, like, trying to figure out how to do that without going back to his old ways, you know. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any problem with Volpe's offense. I think he's done enough. And it just feels like in certain games, he's like one of the best hitters in the game. So it's like the numbers and sometimes like what you see don't always match up. But I I, I do think he's he hasn't been great the last couple of days. I mean, it's kind of stood out to me that he hasn't really – he hasn't had like good games offensively. The thing with Volpe not walking is like he did walk in the minors. Like yeah. He had double-digit walk rates in the minors. I'm looking here. In rookie ball, 15.3%. A ball, 19.8%. High A, 10.5%. Double A, 11.5%. He barely played in triple A. He had an 8.1%. But you know his walk rate this year is down to 6.9%. He hasn't walked since May 30th. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I just – I mean, but every year that 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 walk rate has declined. So, I mean, I, I think it's just continuing that trend. I I personally don't expect Volpe to have like a high walk rate. I think he's just gonna go there and be aggressive and hit the ball. I mean, I, you know, even those numbers show that like he's he's as the years have gone on, he's taken a different approach. He's been way more aggressive. So, um, I don't know. I I agree that like if you're if you're going to like take that approach, you have to drive the ball more consistently. I totally agree with that. I, I think he's just, he's going to have to like find that sweet spot. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And the best part is he's 23 years old. So there's plenty of time to do that. Right. Um, obviously his um, approach coming into the year was I'm going to use all fields. I'm going to hit the ball the other way. I'm going to get on base. I'm going to, you know, cause havoc on the base pass when I'm on base you know, you just have to find a, the middle ground. Last year was one end of the, the spectrum. This year, it feels like it's on the other end of the spectrum. So, like like yeah. you said, finding the in-between is is where you want to live. Yep. Agreed. All right. Thank you to everybody who uh, sent us mailbag questions. Um, thank you to the good doctor for the rant and the opportunity to talk about those things.
Uh, any final words, Chris, before we get out of here? Um, no, I'm just excited to watch the games this week. Two good teams coming to town. Should be a really fun week at the stadium. Yeah. So with that, uh, we hope you enjoy the Baltimore series and the Atlanta series. You can find us on all of your favorite podcast platforms. You can also find us on YouTube of the same name. Please leave us a five-star review. Please send us more mailbag questions. We enjoy them. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. And we will speak to you next week.